<laughs> but I'm here and I'm so excited to see you all. Um, this is our, our last meeting of the, the TLC event, um, the TLC Professional Development Series for the semester. Ash, have we done the land acknowledgement already? Uh, no, not yet. All right, so we're gonna, I'm going to pause for a minute. We're going to do our land acknowledgement and then we'll have some announcements. And can you see what I want you to see, Don? Perfect. I see a thumbs up. So here we go. As the first land grant institution established under the 1862 Morrill Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is historically home to many native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized native nations the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska and the Sac and Fox Nation, Missouri, in Kansas and Nebraska. Many Native nations utilized the Western Plains of Kansas as their hunting grounds, and others, such as the Delaware, were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. It's important to acknowledge this, since the land that serves as the foundation of this institution was, and still is, stolen land. We remember these truths because K-State's status as a land-grant institution is a story that exists within ongoing settler colonialism and rests on the dispossession of indigenous peoples and nations from their lands. These truths are often invisible to many. The recognition that K-State's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential. Please remember these truths because we still remember. Thank you. And and thank you all for being here. I, I think I forgot to announce to introduce myself. I'm Don Saucer. I'm the faculty associate director of the Teaching and Learning Center. And I'm so excited to see all of you. I think I know all of you personally, which is which is nice. For those of you watching asynchronously, I hope that I know you too, and you're probably wonderful people. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, number one, if you're looking to get a professional development certificate from the TLC or to become a, a TLC fellow, the information has just been dropped into the chat. It's also available on our webpage. So please check that out. Um, it's, it's a really cool thing, and we like you being part of our TLC community. Um, also, the recordings of all these events are available asynchronously, so you can always check those out at our website at any time um, if you'd like to see what we're kind of talking about. And for those of you tuning into this chat asynchronously, I'm glad that you're listening in. Um, our SOTO Showcase, we're very excited about our SOTO Showcase, is this coming Monday. Um, uh, May 6th from 1.30 to 4.30 in Hale 181. I know some people on this call right now are presenters in that, and we're very excited for that. I think we've got 10 oral presentations and a number of poster presentations as well. We're super excited. A lot of amazing ideas are going to be shared on Monday afternoon, so please be there if you can. It's an in-person event. Um, we do not have a, a Zoom capability for that event, so I, I do apologize for someone who wouldn't be able to attend for that reason. Um, Different announcement, uh, we've put out an accommodation survey. Uh, one of the things that I've done this semester, I've been part of a disability accommodations work group. Um, we're trying to be a you know, state-of-the-art campus about being accessible, being accessible and providing support for our students proactively, not just reactively. And one of the things that we're doing is we're kind of surveying faculty's experiences with providing accommodations to their students. Ashley has dropped uh, that link into the chat. We had it in a K-State today a little bit ago. We'll put it in a K-State today. We'll send it out over social media again. Um, but if you haven't had opportunity to do that, it's a fairly brief survey. Um, and it would really kind of help us out kind of understanding what people are doing in their classes and what they're potentially having trouble with doing. And also some questions about the Student Access Center and what you know about that. So uh, that would be really helpful for some of the efforts that we have on campus. Any questions about any of those announcements? All right, excellent. So as this is our last meeting of the semester, one of the things I do often, you've probably you know done this with me if you've you know been to some of these events, whatever, I love to talk about wins. So what I'm gonna ask to the extent that you're willing to share, I want to know about a teaching related win. I'm saying teaching related because it doesn't have to be classroom teaching. It could be supervision, advising, mentoring, any of those kind of things, but a teaching related win from this semester. And I know some of y'all have them because I've had conversations with you recently. So uh, who would like to share a teaching related win from the semester? I have one. Excellent. Um, so I've been sitting in on Mike Finnegan's Lead 212 class this spring because my CAT community students will take it in the fall. And I've 
not as familiar with the class. So I really wanted to know what they'll be learning so that I can complement that nicely. And it's just been a really wonderful opportunity to be in the classroom and watch someone else teach, um, interact with a lot of students that I normally wouldn't get to interact with, um, and, and just kind of see and hear lots of small group discussions and hear what students are thinking about um, and how much some of this information matters to them and how they grow and change throughout the semester. So that's been a really great opportunity in that regard. That That is fantastic. Mike Finnegan is one of my favorite teachers on campus. Um, it's when when you try to learn about teaching and you go and you see a, a fantastic teacher like Mike Finnegan, it's important if you've ever had the opportunity to do this, and Melissa, you may empathize this, you never try to be like Mike, right? Like it's, you, you've got to kind of take, but Mike is, is a hard person to be. The level of energy and engagement that he brings is, is really, really hard to aspire to. And if it's not you, it's not going to work, but, but I, I love Mike Finnegan. And I'm glad you get to, to see him teach. Yeah, he was on the cheer squad at K-State at the same time that my first year roommate was also on the cheer squad. And I thought about this the other day. I said, Mike, do you know Stephanie? And he's like, yeah, heck yeah. You know, like Mike would say, yeah. you know, um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was really fun. That That is fantastic. Who else has a teaching win from the semester? And actually, I'm going to, I'm going to change that. It's not who has, it's what is your teaching win for the semester? Because I know y'all got some. And oh, Carrie, I'm going to cold sure. call because we just talked about one right right before this, right? Carrie was telling me about this wonderful win. So Carrie, if you wouldn't mind sharing out. Um, I tried some mindfulness activities in my intro psych class and um, it was, I was expecting um, some positive outcomes. I was hoping for that. And then I did a end of the semester reflection with everybody and the entire class, like not a single student, um, didn't say that I should keep doing it. Even when they said it wasn't like for them the best thing, they all said that they thought their classmates benefited from it. And then they um, all said really positive things about how much they loved me and the class and how much I cared for them, which I wasn't expecting. Like I, it was in their like final comments. I thought they might say something about like how I could make the meditation, uh, mindfulness things better. And then it was just love. And so I realized that I, we were facilitating a connection with each other that I wasn't expecting. Like I, you always hope for that, but I didn't know that it was going to do that. So anyway, that's my win. Now there's, there's a couple of reasons I called on Carrie. Number one, because I know Carrie's doing awesome stuff. I, I knew this win was there. But also, Carrie is one of our speakers at the Soto Showcase on Monday. So if you want to say, wow, what did Carrie do to make that happen? Come listen to Carrie give a talk on that Monday afternoon. It's, it's going to be amazing to kind of hear what she did. But the one of the things I also mentioned to Carrie when we talked earlier today is these are the kind of things when you have them, like save that. Like there's a day when things aren't going maybe as well. Maybe you get an argument with a student or they didn't do as well in an exam. Read those comments. That's, it's a great way to kind of uplift yourself in those moments where we do need a little pat on the back. Our students have already provided that. So, so keep that close. What are some other teaching wins that we have? I have one. I don't know that yeah. this is a win for my program, <laughs> but it was a win for me. Um, I had a, a student of color tell me that, and I teach an upper level class. So this is one of her last courses before she graduates. But uh, my class was the first time that she'd see, been seen, like she felt seen um, by our content. So, um, which again, is sad for our program, but it was um, very, empower not empowering, but just very like good to hear that I'm doing the, the right thing. Because sometimes what I talk about in the classroom is controversial and not everyone likes it. And then for someone to say that they were seen and that was, like the first time they'd felt seen um, was really impactful. Yeah, I think that's, that. I'm ambivalent about that comment for the same reasons that you are. I'm, I'm really glad they made that comment to you. And I really want to congratulate you for making an inclusive environment where that student felt that. Um, but I, I feel really sad that that was a unique experience for them. Um, so hopefully you keep doing you and maybe other people will start to do better too. Well, I was definitely planning on sharing it with my department head. Yeah. <laughs> so, but like, you know, we could probably could do a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. Other wins.
I'm, I'm going to share one if people aren't going to jump in then. So one of the, one of the things that it's, it's important to me in my classes is intrinsic motivation. So I'll often ask my students, you know, why did you come to class? And I want them to say something more than I'm supposed to, you know, I want them to have an intrinsic motivator, something that's more valuable. And, uh, and one of the students is like, I was like, why did you come to class today? And he said, really, this is the best thing I got going on. He's like, this is, this is the, this is the most entertaining thing that I have in my week. Um, I really feel connected to people in here. I just think he's, he said, this might be sad, but this is, this is what I got, you know, kind of thing. And I was like, well, I'm glad you have that here, you know, kind of thing. I won't speak for outside this, but um, I was, I was kind of excited. And this is a student who moved from the back row to the front row, you know, at some point in the semester, he said, you know what, I want to be closer to this experience. Um, and he's contributed. And, and that's been, that's been really kind of nice to see um, that someone felt my class was the best thing going on for them. And I'm going to take that as a compliment rather than a, a statement on the other things going on in that student's life. Other wins. I'll say that this semester I have been teaching our fourth semester Spanish course um, online and asynchronous for the first time. And so I was a little bit nervous as to how that was going to go because with a language interaction is so important um, and like trying to figure out like how what that's going to look like and how I'm going to make it happen in an online asynchronous environment was daunting. Um, and here I am in the last week of class. And I think it's been pretty successful. I've had really high engagement all throughout the semester um, from my students. And they have been commenting on how much they like having like the interactions that we have. So we use VoiceThread to, to do um, asynchronous interactions. And so every week they have a voice thread and they have a warm up that's always something kind of silly, but that helps them with the skills that we're developing for whatever we're working on um, at that time. And so, you know, sometimes it'll have to do with like, you know, instantly debatable topics, like which what's the correct way to like hang toilet paper. Um, it just like things like that. And they really liked them. Yeah, like this way or this way. And I have an image and they have to like comment on it. Um, and they've, they've just really like gotten into it. They'll get into debates with each other. Um, and they've commented on how much they like having those moments in class. And so that they, they first comment and then like a couple days later, they have to go back and listen to their peers and what their peers thought and comment on that, go back and forth a little bit. And so it's been really fun to see it actually play out. I had in my mind kind of how it was going to go, but I just didn't know what that was gonna look like in practice. Um, and I've been pleasantly surprised that the students have really been taking to it. Um, we also talked about zombies as a use for when teaching hypotheticals. And uh, I do that in class all the time to talk about like, what would you do if the zombie apocalypse happened right now? Where would you go? What, how would you respond? Um, and the students uh, in class, they always love it, but the online also uh, worked really well. <laughs> So there, there, there's so many things to, to like about that answer. And I, I love that you're playing. I love that it's working well with your students. I love that zombies are involved. Um, there, there's, there's so many cool things there. I, I'm, I'm really excited for your win. I, I do want to also kind of add, I have a, my daughter is, is taking high school Spanish and she'll, I, I took four years of high school Spanish, which means I speak Spanish un poco, right? Like, <laughs> and that's the level of my accent right there too. Um, so she'll have me read these essays that she's written and it'd be like, none of this is true. And she'd be like, yeah, but those are the only words I know. So it's, it's kind of- Oh, I always encourage, I tell my students, I'm like, in this class, I was like, anything that's like asking like personal information, I'm like, you can lie. Like when we're talking right. about like looking at societies and like, <laughs> you know, like there's things that you can't lie about, right? When we're looking at um, specific information. But I'm like, if I'm asking you like, what's your favorite class? And you're like, ooh, I don't know how to say biochemistry. You can be like, historia. I love Historia. Yeah. It's my favorite. <laughs> like, I don't care. I just want to see that you understood my question and that you can provide a, a reasonable answer, an appropriate answer. Um, so I, I'm like, this is probably the only class where you, I, your teacher is going to encourage you to lie. <laughs> yeah, I would say her, her autobiographies are not very truthful. So it's, <laughs> it's kind of fun. <laughs> I bet they're fun to read, though. Oh, they're amazing to read. And it's, it's fun because all of her friends are short and funny because because she knows those words, you know, so, so. 
carry s short and funny you know whatever and just like just goes to all of them melissa s short and funny um it's, it's, it's kind of fun to see that happen all right any so i have a, I have a couple of things i want to talk i always have some you know questions in my back pocket but before we get there any concerns or issues that people kind of want to crowdsource share out I'll say one thing that is, I, I try not to to vent on students or any of those kind of things. I don't think that's super healthy, but you're all in my inner circle and I'm, I'm going to take just a moment to share a frustration. Um, I do what I call Mad Lib announcements in my class. So what that means is that I do the announcement, but the students actually make the announcement. So I'll be like, everyone has to complete and they'll say seven research credits. And how many of those are online? They'll all say four, you know, those kind of things. So they actually make the announcements back to me. So we do this every single day, the entire semester. I've had like three emails this week of students saying, hey, I don't understand, insert something that have been in the announcements every single class period of the entire semester. And I'm a huge advocate of when a student reaches out to say, hey, you know, this is where you can find that information, but this is the answer. I'm not, I'm not giving them the answer. I just couldn't. I just couldn't. I kind of kind of researched like, no, no, no. This is something the students recite back to me every single I I can't do that. You have to find someone in class to tell you. Um, but it's just I didn't feel wonderful about it. So that's like my little infancy kind of popping out. But it, it I finally kind of reached that point where I was like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not doing that. So I don't know if anyone else had had experiences like that. I don't want you to think different of me as a teacher or any of those kinds of things, but my empathy kind of reached its limit in that moment. I've That's... definitely <laughs> go ahead, Andy. I've definitely been getting to the end of my empathy on a few moments where I've had, you know, I've talked in this group before about how I do interactive rubric creation and that the students are involved and they always are very well aware of, of what they have to do and we have these conversations about it. And I've had a, a few uh moments this semester where students are like they, what they submit to me, I'm like, you were in class when we had this like what what happened and so i don't i don't know what is it, what's going on but i have definitely felt that this semester yeah i was just gonna say don that makes sense especially if it's something you know if you mention something once or twice in class sometimes it doesn't sink in because there's just so much information coming at humans but if it's every single day and it's a really simple thing at a, at a certain point, they have to do their part. And so, you know, if it's, well, you missed class Wednesday and I said it one time, you know, that's one yeah. thing, but it all semester long, I wouldn't want to answer that question either, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, you, you come to one class, you had the answer, you know, it's just, I don't, I don't know. Um, um, I was going to add, I think for me, I'm having the students who are obviously, struggling so much and they've had a really hard semester and so there's the part of me that wants to just keep supporting them the best I can but I've already helped them so much like opened up and given them like opportunities to turn in something late when it made sense with the assignment but then that say there's those few people that you're like where does that where does my compat like you're failing the class. Like I can't take the class for you, you know, like, but it, you feel t terrible because you want to keep supporting them. You know, you're, they're having a hard time, but you also have to be like, this isn't fair to your classmates. And also your grade is so low. I don't think there's anything that I can do to help you, but they're like, please help me. And it, it, it just hurts my heart. <laughs> So you Carrie, the, I struggle with similar things too. And what has helped me was to be able to still treating that student with kindness and compassion, both when you're feeling and the way you're talking to them, awesome. And it makes a huge difference. But I once had somebody, I was trying to help somebody that just really honestly was, was, was beyond me helping at that point in time. This is not a student, but anyway. Um, and someone said to me, do you ever look at it that you're enabling the behavior of the person by continuing to support them when they're not doing their part and you've given them this support and that support? And, you know, that's really specific to the situation. So sometimes students here, it's not enabling and sometimes it is. But I think there are some times when I want to do more for a student. And I think 
but am I, am I helping them in this moment or am I enabling them to continue this behavior in the future, which ends up hurting them? And so that's what, that's what helps me when I think, but I want to help them. And I think, but long-term me saying no, or me saying, this is what you need to do in order to succeed. And here's, here, here's what I can do. And here's what I can't do is helping them long-term. And I think of a story my dad told me, he's retired now, but he ran a business, um, for many, many years, and he once had to, he has had to terminate employees over that time, and he always hated doing it. But he once had someone that he had to let go after multiple conversations. It was no surprise. But 15, 20 years later, the person came back with his family and said, Thank you for letting me go. I was not doing what I needed to. I have since figured out my life. Here's my family. You know, thanks for holding me to what I needed to do. So, I mean, Kind of a unique situation. Not everybody's going to come back and tell you that. But if you think about, okay, is me saying no, is it helping the person eventually because I'm providing these reasonable boundaries and a lot of support? That's what's helped me when I have wanted to help people and do all of the things for them. And I think, but is that actually going to help them or is it just making them dependent on me? I don't know if that helps you at all, but it's something that occasionally has helped me. That's one no, thing that I, I remind love that myself. I remind myself a lot of this, that like, I, I try my best to work to match my students' effort. So it's like, if they're working really hard, if they're coming to my office and they're like, I just don't understand this, I need help. And they're there and they're like invested. I will invest so much. I'm there to help them. But if it's like, I don't get it. Can you spoon feed it to me? It's like, uh, no, I can provide you resources. And then when you use those resources and you have questions about them, I'm here to answer them. But um, thinking about like matching the student's energy has helped me a lot because I have a tendency to also uh, want to do work for my students and like just give them everything that they need to succeed. Um, but if they're not taking the opportunities that I'm giving them, then it's, it's like Melissa said, you end up kind of enabling them and not actually giving them the support that they need. Yeah, I think I really like that. I, I find sometimes, though, that in the moment, I can't really tell how much the student is trying because in the moment, they seem really committed. They seem in and there's but the evidence doesn't kind of bear out that they're matching that level of engagement that they're showing me in that moment. Um, I think, uh, number one, I dropped a video in the chat that we've made before about called You Cannot Succeed for Your Students, because one of the things that it, it makes me like you as a teacher, Carrie, is when your students don't perform well or don't do well, it affects you, right? And, and I think that's kind of a, a good sign as a teacher. It's it's kind of a rough emotional burden to have to carry, but that, you know, that makes me think you're probably doing it right. Um, there was a, a student in my principal's college teaching class this last fall who said it really nicely, and I probably won't be quite as eloquent as she wasn't saying it, but said she said something along the lines of, no, you can, you can extend a deadline, you can provide an extra resource, but your students have to perform. Um, and at the end of the semester, you know, you've, you've done what you can do, but your students have to perform. And if they perform at a D level, they get a D. If they perform at a B level, they get a B. Um, so it's, it's just about setting that context. So hold yourself responsible, at least what I try to, I try to hold myself responsible for saying, if the student failed, it wasn't me. Um, and in those situations, it makes me feel a little bit better. You know, I was like, I did these things. It's not on me. It is on the student ultimately to perform. And sometimes there are extrinsic factors, external factors that get in the way of that student's performance. But that's why we have an Office of Student Support and Accountability and, and all those other kind of things to take that into account. So just, just make sure it's not on you and then sleep as well as you can at night. You know, it's what I would kind of suggest too. Something that's also helped me, um, and this occasionally I've gotten a feedback from a student where there's academically in my class, there's not much they can do to turn around, but I'm still able to convey that I care about them as a human being and a person. And I've had students either say or write anonymously on TVLs, I know I didn't do well in this class or I know I'm going to fail, but I knew you cared about me and that helped. So like, even if it doesn't impact their current grade in your current class, it can still be a help to them. And like Don was saying, it, it can be really super hard to tell the effort. And I used to write a big long pan. Okay, you're eight weeks behind. Let me write a plan for you. If you follow this plan, you'll catch up and you do it. And I rarely had students do it. And so what I ended up changing to was, here's the first, depending on the student in the class, the next step, or maybe the next two steps, 
I recommend you finish these one or two things by X date and then check in with me and then we'll form the next step of the plan. And then if it's, then it's less overwhelming for them, but then they also, they have those one or two things to do. And if they are invested in making an effort, then they'll come back and they'll say, I got it done, or I got it done early, or I met the deadline, or I, you know, it's taken me an extra day, but I'm doing it. It gives you an idea of what they're putting into it. And then you can provide that next level support. Whereas if they don't even take steps one and two, you've done the beginning and then you can stop there. So it kind of helps you figure out how to match their level of effort by just giving them one or two of the next things to do. Um, and if a student is really just overwhelmed, or especially if they're new to college and they just don't know where to begin because they've fallen behind and so they've avoided it and now they're in a worse shape, just telling them, okay, here's the one or two things to do first. Even if it's, I want you to contact tutoring and make an appointment, let me know when you've got it set and then we'll talk about next steps. Or you are missing 10 assignments, do this one first. Here's why I'm having you do this one first, turn it in, then we'll talk about what should come next. That has helped me save so much of my time and effort. And then as a student, has, if they progress and they meet those couple steps, then I say, okay, now I want you to write a plan and they might be sitting in my office while they do it. You write down everything you need to do, figure out the order, then let's discuss it. If I have any feedback for you about actually do this one first or that one's not worth as much because they may not be stopping to figure out what's important in the class or they may not have the math skills to really figure out where to put their time and energy. You can say, this looks like a great plan. Awesome. Tweak this little thing and go from there. And then they have also built the tools for if they kind of get themselves into the situation in a different class, especially if they have a teacher who isn't able to provide that level of support for them, that they know how to do it. Um, so that's something that's helped me a lot when students get behind <laughs> or need that help. I love how practical that advice was. That is that is amazing, Melissa. Thank you. Any other issues or concerns people would like to kind of bring up for, for the group? So I have a question. Yeah. Um, and this could be for any situation, not just with students. It might be colleagues or someone you supervise, someone who supervises you, et cetera, et cetera, anything. Let's say you're in a position to give someone feedback and you give them both positive feedback as well as constructive things to work on and they're not great at accepting that feedback. Maybe they shut down or they only hear they only hear the things that are that are negative or feel negative to them or um, instead of saying, okay, how can I grow and learn from this? They stay stuck in that spot of kind of being shut down or not knowing how to make changes or anything. Um, what are some of the things you do? I know that's a really open question, but when people aren't good at receiving feedback, what are some next next steps or things that you, you think can help people when that isn't really well received? So I'm, I'm glad you saved an easy question for us. <laughs> so, so what are people's thoughts on this? And just in case people aren't getting sarcasm, I was being completely sarcastic. This is a very difficult and complicated situation. Um, thoughts that people have on this one. I, I don't know that I have a great answer myself. So I'm I'm looking to, to learn from some of you. I have, well, sorry, go ahead, Andy. Go ahead. No. Um, I don't, I'm the person who had a line this was saying, I'm not sure this works, but <laughs> it's how you say it. So I've started using terms like, um, when I go to grade, like a discussion post, like this post would have been stronger with, instead of saying, you didn't do this. I'm like this, you know, a stronger approach would have been X, Y, Z. And I have another one where I, this is one where their grade isn't writing on it, but like, and I, I keep a feedback bank of common terms I use constantly. So I use like, this was a great start. Here's the things I saw that were great. And here's the things that, um, here's our suggestions for improvements. And, and then I explain why, like it's a, it's a, they have to do a, re, a educational resource and they have to use the principles of like health literacy and oral literacy and print literacy. And it's like, oh, people who don't read very well need bullet points. And they and I explain the why of the why this would be stronger with this behavior change. Um, whether that inspires anything, I don't think they actually read my comments at the time. So I'll leave it at that. I was gonna say I like the phrasing you offered, Kathleen. Sorry, go ahead, Andy. No, it's fine. Um, 
this maybe doesn't help after the fact, but I try to kind of nip that in the bud beforehand. So talking with students about um, feedback, like for each other, for themselves, like we talk a lot about evaluation in, in my class. And so talking about um, how to give and how to receive feedback. And that's something that I think is important that you should always give feedback. Um, there's a quote that I like, I just copied it. I'll put it in the chat um, about feedback. That feedback should be informational rather than controlling. So rather than saying like, you should do this. I love the word consider and I use it all the time in my feedback, like consider this, what would it look like if you did this? Like to, to really put it on like, this is a decision and I'm not telling you what to do. I'm asking you to imagine what it would look like if you did this. Um, and so inviting students to think about that as well. And then also to remind them that, that they should give feedback, thinking about what is, you know, what ways you can help your peers and that you should take feedback, um, assuming the best intentions from the person who gave it to say like, okay, you know, assume that they are trying to help you um, and that they have their best, unless you have evidence to the contrary, assume best intentions that they're trying to help you and, and, and um, make your work better. And that this isn't about you, it's about the work um, and that you, your worth is not connected to what you produce. So, so all that to say, I do a lot of front loading with it. Um, after the fact, it's, I don't know. <laughs> so, so Andy, I, I, I love that. I'm kind of thinking though of the, the resistant student, because I think the, the, the student who's, who's trying their best and, and is there and they're listening, I, I think that's going to work well, but I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, maybe a student who doesn't want to hear it. And I say, you might want to consider they might then make that mistake again several times, you know, in my class, when in reality, it's if you don't do this, you're not going to do well in the next kind of thing. So is there is there kind of a different strategy if it really is more straightforward, right? It, it's it's you really you can't do this again. Um, like, I, I don't know, because I, I found sometimes when when I've tried to be softer in my language, the students don't get it as well especially the students who are a little bit more resistant. He said, well, you said I should consider it. I did and I didn't. And I decided not to do that. Like, well, in reality, that's then you forfeited points on the next assignment. So it's, I'm just kind of wondering, is there is there a way to, and I'm thinking of a specific recent example where I gave a student feedback and they didn't get it. And I gave the student the same feedback again and they still didn't get it. And on the third time they came back with a, really weird interpretation of what they preferred that I said. And I was like, that wasn't it at all. And at that point I just gave up. I was like, all right, this just, just isn't going to work. Um, so what do we do when they really are resisting? I mean, that's tough. And I think that, so this goes into what I think about a lot is that like, sometimes students just aren't ready for the feedback that we have for them. Um, and even when we are pretty explicit. Um, they're just not at a point where like it, it makes sense to them where they get it. Um, and to know that like, just because we're teaching them now doesn't mean that they're learning it now. Um, sometimes we're just planting seeds that aren't going to grow until maybe years after they graduate and maybe never, you know? Um, so I don't want to say like, it doesn't matter. It's hopeless. I don't want to have like a negative attitude about it. But I think that there's a certain amount that like students can only take what they're prepared, intake what they're prepared to intake, what they have yeah. the frameworks for and what they can handle. And sometimes students just aren't there. And you can say, look, like this is being more explicit and saying like, for this assignment, this is the expectation you did. And I will do that with my students when they don't meet the mark, say, like, here's the expectation that we set. This is how you're not meeting the mark. Um, that's different than like, uh, consider doing this. I would use that language more in when it really is a choice. Like okay. when you do this, like this is kind of the messaging that happens. This is like the way that it might be received. These are some considerations. And then there's, this is the expectation for this assignment and you did not meet it because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think that that's appropriate. You're still gonna have students that, the next assignment, they do the same thing because mm -hmm. they're just not at a point where they 
get it. Yeah. Um, um, one of our colleagues in the chat, just because I don't, I don't know if people are going to be able to read the transcript of the chat while they're uh, watching this asynchronously said, they're not saying this is a positive way to approach it, but sometimes my students get this, quote, I'm looking forward to seeing better work from you. That is a better reflection of your time and attention, end quote. And then they put hashtag passive aggressive. So uh, <laughs> I think those are I think those are the emails sometimes like my imaginary self sends, but real Don probably doesn't send those very often. <laughs> At least not anymore. Some of my students from 15 years ago might have said, yeah, you sent those emails. I don't send those emails much anymore. Carrie, you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to add last semester, I had a situation where it was a very heavy based discussion class and things. Um, I had a student who was monopolizing the conversation and he was so excited to have a place to share these ideas. And I was so excited for him. He didn't get any of this outside of class where he felt like he could talk about these topics in a deeper way, but he was taking all the time and other students wanted to talk and they were getting really upset. And I didn't, um, I tried to have a private conversation with him ahead of time because I wanted to, to, so I didn't want him to get angry as I knew that that was gonna happen. He was a very sensitive and then to anger. And then um, I did that hot take kind of like Andy did to practice discussion skills and um, he refused to participate. And then after class, he kind of talked to me in a very elevated voice about how that was a kindergarten thing and how it was all, obviously all coming from a place of, sh of shame. He felt like that was all because he messed up and he did something wrong. And I just brought him to my office. And I think that I tried, I'd already cho showed him that I cared a lot about him. And we just talked about like all the things he did so well. And I tried to use it as a moment to focus on all the things that like, instead of you looking at it like a moment that you, why don't you be more like me? Use it as a leading opportunity. If you have a cool idea, why don't you broach it to the group? So I tried to show him how the things like, don't you want to go to grad school? Like, what are your goals here? Because what I'm trying to help you develop are things that could help you become somebody you want to be. Because I think you're already doing such a great job. And I just kept like going back to how he's good, how he's so good, right? And like trying to reduce the shame that he was feeling. It took an hour and a half, but by the time he left my office, he was in a, a really good place. And he was like, he came to class the next time and he used some of the techniques that I gave him so that he could feel like his ideas were being shared, but his classmates were involved. So I think that um, part of addressing this is that having that connection, if you don't have that relationship with the people, you're not gonna be able to, um, they're just gonna feel like it's coming from a bad place. I love that. And I, I agree with you 100%. And that's awesome that you gave him an hour and a half of your time and, and he left feeling good. And I would love to hear some of the techniques you gave because I don't have this hop happen often, but immediately specific faces come to mind. And I'm like, yeah, that student's monopolizing, but they're excited and they have good ideas and they're engaged, but no one else is talking. And like you said, they might get frustrated or the other students might just be like, you know what? I don't have to answer because so-and-so is going to speak up and everyone's, you know, happy. But so I would love to hear some of the techniques that you told your student to use that that he ended up using in class and that ended up being effective. Right now? I'd love to hear <laughs> sure, something. Put you on the spot, but <laughs> if not, no worries. I'm like, you're willing to share. I think a lot of us. Um, that. No worries. If, if not, but so if to remember back, I think I kind of told him that basically um, we did a lot of prompting. So I would I would have like as I went through the material, I'd have ideas come up and I told him, do you know how I do that? Why don't you when you're preparing, there's all these things you bring up that you want to say, turn them into a prompt for your classmates. Say, hey, guys, um, when I was reading, I had this really cool thought about you know, just set set the stage and then open it up to them to share their ideas because ultimately that's what he wanted, right? He wanted them to talk to him about his ideas, but he would spend the whole time talking about his ideas. And actually, because he talked so much, he didn't think that they had anything to say. He thought he was carrying the load for them because they didn't want to contribute. And I was like, that's not true. Like, so 
there was some perspective shifting that had to happen. And we also talked a lot about um, nonverbal responses that the students were having, which during the hot takes we were able to help because he would sometimes without realizing it be like, Ugh, or whatever. So it kind of, he was very smart, very well read and it was very intense. And it put off his classmates because they were afraid to look stupid. And, and so I told him that I was very straight and direct with him. And I said, your student, your classmates are worried that you're going to think they're stupid. So they're not like, I, I, I was kind, but also very direct. And I told him, you know, like if you open it up and show them that you're interested in them and what they have to share, they're going to be so much more likely um, to share Anyways, it was a beautiful class. I think that was the main thing was that I told him to be like a leader, to step up. And I, I told him that if you want to be a leader in graduate school, start being a leader in my class, you know. That's so great. And I like that you also took the time to talk to the student about what his strengths were. I mean, that's one thing that I think really high, in those cases, highlighting you know, how great it is that the student is enthusiastic. I can always, with those students, really empathize because I'm like, look, I'm a talker. I love, like, I want to talk all the time. Like, so, you know, really putting myself on their level and being like, I've really struggled with this too. Like remembering when I should let somebody else have a turn. And here are some of the things that I have done helps to take away some of that, like the student feeling shame that there, you know, it's like, no, this is just a part of being human. Like we all have our things. Some people, it's a struggle to speak up more. And for some of us, we can't shut up. <laughs> and so, you know, like here are some of the things that I do. Like sometimes I count to 10, you know, like just count to 10 in my head slowly and let other people have an opportunity to talk because, oh boy, I will, otherwise I will jump in right away. Like, right. When I told him that the other students like wanted to talk, that they were excited to talk. It was like he hadn't even considered it, <laughs> right? So he even said something like, I've been trying to sit back and not say anything because he was feeling more like other students weren't doing their share of the work. But I told him, I said, when you do that, don't you see it fills in? I said, but I don't want you to stop participating. I don't want you to stop sharing your ideas. I want to see more of you too, but we have to find a way for your idea to be to be part of everybody else as well. Like you're giving them something too, which he hadn't considered by, by sharing his ideas. He could give them stuff to think about and, and place to speak and have a voice. Yeah. That was a big thing we talked about was it's everybody's responsibility in the conversation to make sure everybody else is talking, not mm -hmm. just Dr. Lane's, but everybody. Like we all, it's everybody's responsibility. If you see someone with their hand raised and they're not getting to talk, you have to take a step back and say, maybe it's, maybe I should let them talk too. So. Yeah. I also find that um, giving students like time space to write their ideas can be helpful when I've had students who are really eager to like, talk and they tend to take up space they like okay we're all going to individually take some time to write out our ideas and that way every student feels like they can get their ideas out and it makes sure then you can do different types of activities with that either like have them get in groups and share what they just wrote or you know collect everything that they wrote and you go through and kind of like just bring up what students said and then have that initiate the conversation but that allows kind of everybody to bring their voices in without have you know that I've had students that they don't even raise their hand they just immediately like I ask a question and they're like boom <laughs> you're like okay like and even like the the gestures where you're like okay like does anybody else like they just like steamroll me <laughs> like, okay um, I'm really glad that you're excited but like let's find some others so writing has been one that helps a lot I've found in the past with those students that really, really want to participate. Well, Perry, thank you for letting me put you on the spot. That was really amazing and helpful. I appreciate it. I will say I have um, one of the students in my general psychology class, and this is a very quiet class compared to my very boisterous class in the fall. It's been kind of a hard shift with those two cohorts for me. Um, 
He sits right in the front. And anytime I need a question answered, he will give me a clear and concise answer. And he's kind of learned. He doesn't answer until I give him the look and then he will answer. So if I ever just need the silence to end, he's there for me. And, and I really appreciate it. And he's not a dominator or any of those kind of things. He doesn't sound frustrated when he does it. I think we need like an ally like that in every class we teach. But I just look, you know, just give me the answer and then I can move to the next thing. So uh, that's that's been kind of helpful. And I haven't had that person in lots of classes that I've taught. So that's been, been kind of cool. I've started using the... Um... Well, depending on how your classroom set up, like my classroom, one of my classrooms is set up in like the the half moon and it has like wedges. So when I, and I have a student that is not trying to, again, not trying to monopolize, she just knows it and nobody else is going to talk. They're just waiting for her to answer. So I go like, I want to hear from this wedge. And, you know, I just stand there until somebody from that wedge answers. And then, or if instead of that wedge, I'm like, I want to hear from the back three rows. Kind of thing like I actually like call on it doesn't always work because they still stare at me like I'm on crack but um that at least gives the talker a chance to like not rest but to, her to know that okay we're gonna go to them first and then sometimes yeah I'll turn to her and be like all right what's the answer <laughs> When I was working on this discussion class last semester, after this incident happened, I had like spent an entire week working on critical thinking skills, like teaching them how to have, and but I didn't spend any time teaching them how to discuss. Mm -hmm. And I think that I realized as I was reading all the materials, like I don't think we ever really learn how to have discussions, even in like faculty meetings, like there's, it's like missing. And so I found, I did some deep dives and I found this like really cool um, handbook that this guy had put together all about like a foundation for how to have discussions in your class. And he had all these really cool. So Andy, it was kind of like some of the stuff you talked about, but um, some of it is writing down but they have names like snowballing technique, but there's like a circle technique. Like he has all of them together, all these different things that you can do. And so when we were practicing that day and, and it was Dawn had a hot take suggestion that we just make it silly. So we talked about like, is bacon overrated or whatever. But so like people have like really strong feelings and their face make, they make faces and so we would be like, hey, you just made a face, right? Like, so we kind of were helping each other when there was nothing to lose. Um, like, you didn't have to feel bad about your personal opinion. I mean, unless you feel really strongly about bacon. But um, we could kind of help each other realize that we might be making other people feel bad or feel like they didn't matter or something um, in a, in a non-threatening way. So... Yeah, Melissa is right. Bacon is never overrated. Um, that is an amazing thing. Um, someone had asked in the chat about a, a TLC event about uh, different ways to show learning in the classroom in addition to discussion like graffiti walls and such. Um, I, I'm not 100% sure what event the person is referring to. Um, we did all the events we planned. So I, I don't know if we at one point either did an event with some of that included in it, but it wasn't as big a part as someone wanted, or we maybe misdescribed an event. I don't know. Um, but I, I'm not sure exactly which event to kind of point you out for that. Um, Andy, do you don't like bacon? Okay. I don't like cheese. So that's, that's usually, you know, that's the one character flaw I tell my students, but one character flaw is I don't like cheese. Everything else is perfect. So it's uh it's Don, that's thing. it. It's over. I have that's lost right. all respect. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell Same. you 30 seconds, Same. just to, on this cheese thing, my wife's family, every time we get together, Oh, you don't like cheese? We're like, no, I don't like cheese. We have this kind of, oh, so you don't like, and then they list a hundred kinds of cheese. Like, no, I don't like any of those kinds of cheese. And then we repeat every time I see them. Like, we've had they're this hoping you'll grow and change. Years. What is happening? Yeah, they're hoping you I grow. You keep thinking yeah. you're going to realize how wrong you are. <laughs> like, oh, I'm, that's what cheese is. Like, I'm uh, literally eating cheese right now. <laughs> I have a colleague who likes warm cheese. Or she, it's hilarious because she has all these, this kind of cheese in this circumstance I like and this kind of cheese in this circumstance I don't like. So it's kind of, it's kind of funny, but no <laughs> cheese, Don. <laughs> no cheese. Oh, and for, for a while, my wife would sneak it into stuff thinking like, and I'm like a super taster. So like, ugh, like it'll make me gag. So I was like, no, this is, this is not good. 
All right. So we are we are near time and we didn't get to the topic I want to talk about. So I'm just going to very kind of briefly, um, I'll, I'll turn it more into my thoughts and then you can kind of respond is um, summer's coming up. Right. And, and I realize a lot of us are, quote, nine month employees, which does not mean the summer is off. Right. It means that now we have maybe less teaching to do while we do the other things that are part of our faculty and administrator roles. Um, one of the the kind of coolest things that I've seen from psychology, and there's a bazillion cool things that come from psychology, right? It's the greatest field on, on, on earth, um, is this idea of either cognitive renewal or strategic renewal. Both terms are kind of used in the literature. And what cognitive renewal and strategic renewal are, are fancy terms that cognitive psychologists have come up with to get people to take breaks. Because one of the things they find is that high achieving people, type A people, you know, people who have like lots of ambitions and goals, they don't take time off. They're, they're afraid that if they're to, to rest, if they're to take time to recharge, they'll lose their inertia, right? And they'll never be able to build that back up again. And they won't be productive and they won't get promoted or tenured or whatever their goals happen to be. Right? So, so what they've done is they now call it strategic renewal or cognitive renewal. So now people will schedule time off, understanding the time off makes them more productive when they re-engage. So you have to basically tell people resting is productive or they won't rest. So one of the things that I, I do want you to kind of take away as we start to enter, you know, those summer months is, you know, whether you're a 12 month employee, nine month, whatever is self-care is important. We've talked about this a lot. This is a theme throughout a lot of our events. Try to find something that brings you joy. Try to kind of let up on your own expectations for yourself a little bit. I'm, I'm saying, you know, I don't have the luxury of taking three months off. I, I don't I have a lot of things I need to do to make this stuff happen. For instance, Ashley and I'll be planning the TLC series over the summer for next year. Right? So we can't just show back up in August and make this whole thing happen. We've got to take time. Um, but I'm going to take time off for myself because I want to and I need to. And it's going to make me better when I come back. I find for myself, when I take some time off, there's sort of a period where I start to crave it again. There's a period where it's like, you know what? I want to have meaning with this individual and that individual. You know, I want to get back to this project. That's probably a good place to be rather than just kind of feeling like kind of your soul has been sucked out by all the things that are kind of being expected. So you don't need my permission, but I hope you hear my encouragement that you should take some time off and do something that is personally fulfilling, that is emotionally satisfying over the summer months, and it shouldn't be work 24-7 then. Um, and, and I hope, uh, your supervisors agree. So that's, uh, that's, that's my kind of plug. Um, and we don't have that much time left. Does anyone have any kind of ideas for how to do this responses to what I said or anything like that? I just think that's a good reminder. I've been kind of thinking about how to be intentional about my summer and thinking like, okay, I think that if I plan to do like like a shorter amount of work, like, okay, like get up, work out, go to the gym, whatever, like do something like for me. And then like two hours of work and then play for the rest of the day. I'm like, I think that I could actually be extremely productive. Um, but yeah, like trying to figure out like, what's that, what is that going to look like for my summer? One of the, one of the things that I do, I don't, I don't like saying two hours because I don't know what two hours sorts of means. What I do is I talk about noticeable changes on things. So I might say, I'm going to make a noticeable change in a manuscript four days out of these five days. It might take me five minutes to make that noticeable change. I might get into flow and might spend three or four hours. So for me, it's kind of that, that step forward every day, but I don't put a time on myself because I got two kids and be driving around all over the place. I don't know if I'm going to have a two hour under a box. So it's, there's things that I try to do, but whatever is going to kind of work for you, that's fine. And you know what? If you don't do your two hours today, that day has gone by. Don't worry about it. Don't try for four the next day. Um, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't work. Have your, your oldest get her license and uh, that changes life incredibly. It's amazing. Friday. Friday, she gets her license that she can drive to work, school, and church on her it own. Changed, it changed my life. <laughs> Yeah, like, that's gonna be that's gonna be because you can't drive. My oldest picked up my youngest. Me, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's just it's amazing. <laughs> I gotta say though, I don't I don't know how long it's gonna take me to not worry obsessively when she's out of the house in the car by herself. That's I have not gotten there yet, so I don't I okay. can't speak to that. Okay. Uh, terrified every time, but my mom still makes me tell her when I get somewhere. 
<laughs> and I'm 45 and she's in her 70s. So maybe never, you know, so <laughs> All right. my, my wife just got this like, I, I, I don't know the name of it, but this super fancy tracking app that is like more than just the find my app. But the super fancy tracking app that we get now notifications when she arrives at certain places and all those kind of things, it actually tracks the speed she drives and all of that. So if she's not great at texting us when she gets there, we'll already know. Um, for So that's going to hopefully help us out a little bit. My neighbors once interrupted me during this. This happened this past semester. Um, had gone through some personal things. My parents texted me one morning. I didn't write back right away. They called my mentor. They called my neighbors. My neighbors came over in the middle of a review, exam review I was doing online to knock on my door and make sure I was still alive to go back and text my parents that I was still alive. So yeah, you never, I'm 43. So you never, Yeah. Um, that was one of the most embarrassing things. <laughs> they normally don't do that. They're normally not like that. They just were, I had been through some bad stuff. So they were worried about me, but yes. That That, that is amazing. I was going to come back to your earlier question, Don, yeah, and absolutely. I say this kind of tongue in cheek, but I also mean it. If I take a break, I'm just, you know, if I have to put it in academic terms, you know, I'm just contributing to positive work-life balance culture and being a role model for others, you know, and I mean, I'm joking when I say that, but it really is true. And um, anybody who's worked in a variety of environments, which is probably a lot of us here, there is a huge difference when the people around you never take a rest and when they do. And when everybody around you is like, no, I'm, it's the weekend or no, it's this break or no, I have scheduled a vacation. I will not be responding to emails. I've prepared for that, but now I'm not available and they have those boundaries. Oh my gosh, it just gives you permission to do that. And if that doesn't exist and you do it and can start building that it or maintaining that so it doesn't just shift slowly shift over into um work too much land um it 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 really it really helps and so when when i see people who are in higher positions than me or have been doing things longer and they take breaks it's just i really appreciate it a whole lot so um you know that i think that's something to keep in mind um when we do that for ourselves if we're like but i can't just do it for me i got to do it for other people well you were doing it for other people too i love that um i right before this i was at the health promoting university work group that's where i you know surprisingly became a a breakout room leader um but we were there and one of the people had mentioned that you know for our students to care about their health and well-being faculty and staff have to do it first and, and if we're not modeling those kind of behavior exactly like you're saying, and it's it's not going to matter. So uh, I, I really do appreciate what you're saying there. And hopefully we'll remember to do that as we as we go further. <laughs> all right, so we are about done. Um, I want to I want to thank all of you for being uh, amazing partners, not only in this conversation, but throughout the entire year uh, for our TLC professional development series. Um, my colleagues are going to drop the, the links to the post-event survey, as well as the, the link to about how to become a TLC uh, certificate earner, as well as a fellow. we got the Soto Showcase coming up we're super excited about. Of course, you're going to do the accommodation survey and all of those kinds of things. Um, but I just kind of also remind you, one of the things that we're going to ask you about, and if you don't want to wait for the survey to do it, that's fine too. What do you want for next year? If you have ideas, if you have, and especially if you have an idea and a person who might be able to kind of do that idea for us, shoot me an email directly. Um, we're putting the program together this summer um, and we're we're kind of, we'll always have a kind of a combination of some of those foundational elements year to year that we, we kind of got to have because it's always new people, you know, potentially. We want to keep it fresh. We want to kind of be attentive to the needs that people have and the, and the kind of things that people want to do to extend their teaching excellence. So Anything you kind of have, send it to me. And if you don't have a name for a person, that's fine. If you just have kind of, hey, I'd love someone to do something like this, we can figure it out. It's just helpful if you have an idea in mind um, that helps our searching. Um, but again, I want to thank you for all the things that you've done for your students and for the rest of our campus over the, the course of this entire academic year. Hope you celebrate your teaching wins, and I hope you take some time off this summer. So thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon.